Well, a pattern we have seen in recent times escalating is political correctness. It's now all pervasive, and some of the biggest proponents of it seem more and more to be business, while the biggest critics seem to be ordinary people. There would be customers who've just had enough. We've just discussed in a moment the Queensland Mining Safety Board issue that overnight had to add two women, as I said, to their board in order for it to actually do its job, despite a spate of fatal accidents at mining sites. Now, more and more we see big business use a social issue to try and push their product. Why? What's driving this push to corporate virtue signalling? Joining me tonight is a man who has pulled this issue apart in all its complexity in his new, new book, Corporate Virtue Signalling, How to Stop Big Business from Meddling in Politics. And the man who's joining us now is the author, the Director of the Culture of Prosperity and Civil Society at the Centre for Independent Studies, Dr Jeremy Samet. Great to have you on the show again. My pleasure. I, I love your... Uh, intellectual rigour and in looking at some of these issues because we all feel it's a problem. We see this yeah. creep more and more um, into the space of political correctness by corporates that really used to just advocate for their business mm. or their brand or to sell a product or on economic issues. Now they're quiet on the economic issues but they're absolutely out there on some of these social issues. Um, what is corporate virtue signalling? How do you define it? And give us some examples. Sure. Look, I think the best way to describe it is that it's actually termed within business corporate social responsibility. And what that argument is, is that the business of business can no longer simply be making profits. The argument is that business also needs to consider the interests of broader groups of stakeholders in the community, uh, not just the interests of shareholders. The problem with that is that increasingly we're seeing business get into very divisive questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw it over, particularly over the same-sex marriage debate when business played an unprecedented role. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that, I think, is that the argument for all this corporate so social responsibility for corporate virtue signaling is that it actually you know, helps the brand, builds the reputation of the company and helps business. What I'm arguing in my book is that actually this is actually very divisive because there are literally millions of Australians, millions of shareholders, stakeholders, other members of the community who don't agree with progressive views and values. And that's invariably what business does. They jump on a progressive bandwagon in the name of corporate social responsibility. It's often too not the view of a lot of employees in a business. So it's, the, it's often the women of the board. Yeah. It's a particular push of a CEO or a chairman. It might be bought into by some of the executive, and if they're not buying yeah. in, they're sent out the back door. But by and large, you could have a whole lot of employees who disagree. Now, why is it the causes of the left... I hate that term, progressive. Yep. Uh, why is it the causes of the left that get chosen and not the causes of the right? Well, I think we need to understand that where this is coming from is it's coming from why business is doing more of it as well is that it's become an industry within business. So there is now an army of you know HR managers, uh, people and culture managers, corporate affairs people who push this with inside business. And what they're actually pushing now, they're saying it's not enough for business just to take care of business. They've got to get involved in systemic issue, which systemic change. So this means getting involved in these sort of progressive social and economic issues. What they also say is how we find out what our social licence to operate is, which is another one of the, the jargon terms they use. They say we need to go out and talk to our stakeholders and find out you know, what our social licence is. The realities of the world are that left-wing activism is far more organised, it knows what it wants and knows how to get it. So, of course, they go out and talk to the activists and the activists say, well, you need to sign up to our agenda and that's how business uh, ends up supporting all these causes. And it goes back to the point that most of the media tend to run a left-wing view of the world and the quiet Australians, as you saw, can vote governments in or out, but by and large they stay out of these debates inside a political term. Yeah. Um, I find it, as I said tonight, a really pernicious term. When I studied law a long time ago, I might add, though I did corporate law, and, yeah. and the law of the corporation was to you know, act within the boundaries of the law, pay their taxes... Yeah and uh, make profit for the shareholder. They weren't there um, to, do, to do this very virtue signaling, to pick issues where they thought yep. the wind might be blowing. How did we evolve into this? I have to say, has the big um, institutional weight of industry super funds, union-controlled yep. super funds that own you know, big shareholder blocks mm. of these companies, 
Has that played a role? Look, there is a long history to CSR, a longer one that I discovered when I uh, originally started. And I think you're right, you know, the traditional role of the company is to, you know, focus on shareholder returns and, and the core business of business. I think there is an argument for some time, there, isn't, there is an argument for CSR when it's closely linked to the commercial interests of the business. So just say you've got an environmental issue that you might want to get ahead of and you might want to uh, preempt, say, government action by addressing the concerns of activists. I think that's totally legitimate. But where we are now is that business is basically engaging in naked political activism. Look, there's a big argument about whether it's legal or not. I don't think we should get into the legalities of it because there's a push to make this actually mandatory, to change the company... Uh, to change the corporation's uh, laws to enable businesses to, to do this almost of their own accord and basically use shareholder, shareholders' money. So if we get into that, we'll end up with more CSR, not less. But I think you're right. There are some institutional factors, I think particularly in Australia, given the size of the you know, union-backed um, superannuation... It's about a tr trillion dollars, yeah. yeah. And where they put their money has a big, a, a big not-so-subtle mm. influence on, on companies. Yep. And I know having been privy to conversations, yeah. um, the conversations around the boardroom table, yeah. uh, we, well, we don't want you out there on IR, or we do yeah. want you out there on an issue like constitutional yeah. recognition for Indigenous Australians or same-sex yeah. marriage or climate change is a massive one as well. Well, I think this is a real problem for business, and I, I admit there is this institutional issue with, it, with the investors pushing it. But what business needs to realise is that when they endorse these causes, they literally alienate millions of Australians who don't share progressive views and values. What they also need, should, should realise as well is that, you know, we're meant to be a parliamentary democracy in which, you know, we're governed by the rule of law, not by, you know, men or, or individuals. And what is actually happening here, I think, is that particularly the, the super funds and other ethical investors, they're actually usurping the role of uh, parliament and the people and politicians, and that's who's meant to be governing us. So I think there's another reason why business should stay out of this, and I really struggle with the fact that we've had political events like we've had Trump, we've had Brexit, we've had the Australian election where you know, the quiet Australians have rejected Labor's embrace of progressive ideology and identity politics, but business is still hurtling down this path. And we've seen that recently when a whole slew of big companies came out and supported constitutional recognition. Yeah, and it's interesting. A lot of people would say to me, having worked at the Liberal Party for a long time, the Liberal Party's owned by big business, mm. um, that it looks to big business for policy. I disagree quite strongly mm. with that. I think that um, big business, really big business, and very much like the unions, are on the left side of the argument. Uh, the coalition, I think, takes more interest in what small business mm. have to say, because small business are back where big business used yeah. to be, just focused on running their business, uh, not on all of these social issues. You use the term community pluralism yeah. principle. What does that mean? Look, I think the way to push back against this is to recognise that all this CSR stuff within business is really well institutionalised, there's all these structures and frameworks, yep. and it's often very hard for people who work inside business and want to push back to actually do it. One, one because it's really well established, but also because people who do dissent from progressive agendas can pay a professional and a, and a social price right. by, by pushing back against it. So what I think is they need their own sort of institutional framework to say, you know, we've got to draw the line here, you know, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate role for, for the company to, and an issue for the company to be involved in. So basically the community pluralism principle is it would be incorporated into the language and practice of basically company management. And what it would do, it would hold directors of the company and senior managers accountable for ensuring that, that their CSR doesn't get into political meddling that basically politicise their brand and alienate people across the community. So, so you're saying if we try and uh, get rid of this CSR, community... Um, uh, corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility, thank you. If we try and get rid of it, we're trying to unwind 20 years of institutionalisation of it. Leave that where it is. You're not going to win that war. But what you should do is demand the leaders, when they pick the issues to get involved in, you're demanding as an employer or as a consumer or as a shareholder that the issues have to relate to where, the bi where there's exactly. this value for the business. Exactly. Is that, is that the summary? And not get into issues that basically alienate um, vast swathes of the community and what the pluralism principle would literally do would require them to respect the different views and values, the pluralism of the community, not politicise their brand and, and risk all the unintended consequences. I think the best example I can give of this is that when I used to think of Qantas, I used to think it was the airline that was friendly, that was safe and that fed you. Now, 
nowadays I think of Qantas more in the realm of somewhere between the Greens and the CFMEU, and I don't think I'm alone, in, particularly in the wake of the Israel Folau case. All right, well, you mentioned Israel Folau. I've got a tricky question for you. Do you think sponsors would have reacted the same way to a rugby player quoting or paraphrasing the Bible to a rugby player quoting or paraphrasing the Quran, which is even tougher? I mean, they want mm. the death of homosexuals, not just saying they're going to hell and want them to repent. Do you think that corporate Australia would have gone down as hard on Israel Folau if his name was Mohammed Folau when we were talking about the Quran? Well, I think the obvious answer is no, and uh, that's really part of what I'm saying here, is that, the, is that through this CSR issue, uh, companies have just sort of run with the progressive agendas on all these issues. So I think the obvious answer is no, that wouldn't have happened. But I think that also underlines what I'm arguing here, which is that by getting involved in, you know, these issues in, term, in, in, in terms of so-called diversity and inclusion, what they're actually doing is alienating people who don't hold progressive views and values. And I actually brought more broadly, there's a really important issue here for both the role of companies and broader society. You know, we need to have institutions like companies that are part of a genuine civil society where we can rise above our political differences in the same way we should be able to do that with sporting codes, where we can join together to, you know, work and play, whether it's, you know, to yeah, play a game. To yeah, or to uh, you know, what, what is really the core role of business, which is to create, you know, wealth generating goods and services. Jeremy Sammet, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, Peter.